Okay, there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got you, got you, got you. Yeah, cool. How are you? Good, good. How are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. Where am I calling you today? Chicago. Chicago, nice. Lovely city of Chicago. <laughs> do you live there full time? Yeah, I, I do. We have a home. We have a home in uh, Palm Springs, California. Yeah. Uh, so we go there for the winter time. Mm -hmm. and I work then, you know, I'll do some work out of LA, but yeah. uh, you know, I'll do a lot of personal work maybe around the area and stuff like that. But uh, we try to get out of Chicago only the last few years. We've been trying to get out of Chicago in the winter time because mm -hmm. it's, it's the weather's difficult, you right. know? Yeah. Yeah. So You're calling uh, London, right? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, we're, I'm in London. Uh, actually, uh, we're based in London, but I'm calling from Hastings, which is a small town by the sea in England. Uh, by the sea, huh? Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's not it's not the same as L.A. kind of sea. It's like English sea. So it's like, yeah. you know, choppy and cold. <laughs> I was just watching. A, I was just watching a film this morning while I was working out because I watch films while I work out. Uh, it's the, the name of the film is called By the Sea. Aha. Uh -huh. you, you know it? I don't know it. No, no. With Brad, with Brad Pitt and Angela Jolie. It's, mm -hmm. an, it's, it's an older film. Right. Okay. It's very, it's very, it's very steamy and erotic. So be careful. <laughs> <laughs> was it the one that, where they met uh, and, uh, you know, he famously left Jennifer Aniston after them working together? No, that was, uh, I think it was called something like The Millers or something like that. Yeah. Oh, right. No, that's, that's, that's not the film. This, this was shot after that. Uh -huh. they, were, okay. they were actually a couple at this time. Right, right, yeah. Is it yeah. important to you that you watch many movies? Because obviously you make films yourself. So is it important that you're, you know, keeping on top of what's out there? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that, uh, you know, besides taking pictures and doing uh, the work that I really love to do, uh, watching films is probably my favorite pastime. Uh, I, I, you know, for both my wife and myself, it seems to be like it's that hour and a half, two hours a day that we get to actually stop and, and actually relax and enjoy a little bit of our, you know, our, it's a nice time together and it's peaceful, it's relaxing and we take notes when we watch films. Mm -hmm. I'm preparing myself to shoot a full feature film um, hopefully it's going to begin shooting in 2022, but it may be, you know, because of the COVID and, and all the delays, it may be 2023. Mm -hmm. So uh, it'll be my very first feature film. So, um, I, you know, I, I love to watch these films and I'll actually take my, you know, my, my cell phone out and, and I'll stop a scene and I'll take a picture of a scene that really resonates with me. And uh, I'll use that for inspiration yeah. or influence, yeah. So no, we love watching, we love watching films. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, one film in particular out of your repertoire that is relevant to this conversation is your film Butterfly, um, the short film that you made with John Malkovich, um, whose portrait uh, uh, taken as, recreated as uh, Pope uh, John Paul is featured in our box set that we're putting out of these 10 prints of your artwork. Um, could you tell us a bit about that collaboration, that relationship um, that you you forged with John? Yeah, well, you know, John and I, John and I met uh, about 23, maybe even close to 24 years ago. Uh, there is a wonderful theater ensemble here in Chicago by the name of Steppenwolf, Steppenwolf Theater, which is kind of known as, you know, one of the world's very, 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 very best theaters. And a lot of great uh, movie stars will come out of this theater company. And uh, I received a call about 24 years ago uh, that they needed some portraits of John. John was in a play there. He's an ensemble member. And I had been shooting all the ensemble members for Steppenwolf for years. I worked with them for maybe about 18, 19 years. But one day they sent John over and we had a uh, just, just a really lovely shoot together. 
Uh, we bonded very quickly. I was very, very well prepared uh, for John when he came in. You know, I did my homework. Uh, I had different sets uh, that I had set up. I had my ideas in my mind. I had run through my ideas several times with other people. Um, and so the shoot went very, very, very smoothly. And I think John, he first, I mean, I, I think he really connected with me because everybody who I work with, whether it's a movie star or whether it's um, somebody that I find off the street, I always work with them in with a great deal of respect and care and love. Um, I feel that uh, every single one of my sitters are actually giving me something, you know, as a gift. They're giving me a gift. They're giving me a piece of them. They're giving me a moment uh, of their time. And, uh, you know, many times they're letting me, they're letting me kind of invade uh, their lives because I ask for things from them that maybe normally they wouldn't do. But John really, uh, I think, respected the way that uh, I dealt with him. And he loved that I was very, very well prepared to work with him. And we did some amazing images that first time. And after that, we had a little bit of a chat. And he says, you know, I, I'm in Chicago quite a bit, you know, maybe, maybe we could do this again. And that was the beginning of a relationship that now has gone 24 years. I'm probably close to maybe 200 portraits, different portraits that I've done with John. I've done four films with John, short films, all short art films. And now this feature film that I am working on will star John Malkovich. Wow, okay. Can we, can we get any kind of a scoop on the film, the feature film? Well, it's, it's, about a, it's, a, it's about a troubled transgender, you know, a life growing up um, in a very, very, very difficult um, uh, situation. Uh, and then a battle with religion, battle with God. Uh, so, you know, I've been photographing transgenders for almost as long as I've known John. Uh, I've been photographing transgenders for 22 years. Mm. Yeah, now I'm on to shooting the community of uh, non-binary and uh, you know I just really love this community and what I do in my projects is I, I, I hope that I can use my photography to to maybe educate people that might be uh, born in a home that may not have been taught uh, understanding and love and care for all people, you know, it's um, it's something that I've always felt that we as photographers have the power to change people's minds through imagery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've been, you know, I've been I've been all over the world shooting transgenders, and it's probably a, another three four year project before I'll release the book or the exhibitions of that work. But right now I'm just enjoying the community, enjoying the people, the community. Um, we do some really wonderful sessions together. I'm constantly learning uh, about the community and I've learned you know, what it takes to go through the changes, how their minds, how their minds really, really are, how they really don't feel at all that they were born into the right bodies. And I accept that and I believe that. And I've seen it um, in so many of these beautiful people where they were maybe have born, a, you know, a, a female, but they really, really, really weren't a female uh, at all, you know, that they're mm -hmm. truly, truly a male. And it's just, you know, it's been very interesting to me. So um, that's what the movie's going to be about, you know, but it gets dark, it's very deep. Um, and so that's why I do my research now, you know, when I'm watching films, I'm really spending time researching uh, camera moves. You know, I, I shoot, I sh I'm, a, I, I'm a director. So I've been directing for, um, you know, TV commercials and documentaries and, um, you know, art films for nearly 15 years. Uh, but this will be my very, very, very first feature film. And, 
you know, I want it to be wonderful. I, I don't, I don't want to go in there and be known as, uh, you know, oh, this guy was a photographer and he wanted to be a director. You know, it's not really, you know, how I want, you know, people to look at this film. I want people to understand. I really understand what I'm doing. And I've got a beautiful story to be told. And I want to tell it in a way that's very, very, very beautiful and gripping and something that stands out over and above so much of the, the films that we see today. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I know your work and I'm sure that it will be nothing short of wonderful, definitely, whatever you do. I um, hope so. <laughs> yeah. so um, we, we, we put ourselves on the line, you know, with every project that we do. Um, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with my homage to the Masters project that I did with John. And, uh, you know, I learned a lot about uh, how tough uh, your peers can be on you. And, uh, you know, maybe the jealousies that run deep um, or just the, uh, uh, you know, there, I mean, there, there's, there's a certain amount of harshness you know, in our industry. And uh, if you don't put out something and you don't, you don't stay up at the level that you are um, proposed to be in, uh, they can be very tough on you. So I, I want to make sure that what I do, uh, not that I'm doing it at all for my peers, I'm really doing this for the people, uh, you know, uh, of the world, people who like to watch films. Um, I don't know, you know, I don't, put too much energy into thinking what my peers really think about, you know, I did at one time and then I just found that you could really um, hurt yourself uh, emotionally by paying too much attention to what others may think uh, about your work. And um, so I've, you know, kind of just let go of that there and um, just do the work that I need to do for myself and for the people who I want to do the work for. Mm, that seems like sage advice. Um, going back to this, to the John Malkovich recreation of the of the Pope. So I've read that you you do a lot of research before you do before you recreate those images um, of photographic um, masters. Yeah. Um, with the Pope image, what was the kind of preparation that you had to do with John before that shoot? Yeah, well, that uh, that particular shoot um, was done for a Polish magazine um, called uh, Viva, and uh, the the photo editor of Viva had seen my homage to the master's work and really enjoyed the uh, the project and felt that it was something that they really would like to to do for their magazine. So they came up with a few images for me to reproduce for, for them. But with each one of these projects that I, that I do recreate, um, I go very, very, very deep into my research. And, uh, you know, I'll Google uh, the subject, which in this case was, was Pope, uh, Pope John Paul. Um, I will search, research the wardrobe. You know, I'll sit with my wardrobe stylist, my makeup people, um, and you know the rest of my staff, and we'll sit there and we'll dissect an image. We'll take we'll take imagery that we see um, about the Pope, and we'll blow it up because we want to see where the creases in the face are, you know how much might be underneath the eyes. Uh, when it comes to wardrobe, we blow it up so big because we want to see exactly the exact button, the exact fabric that is used. Um, because in my homage to the Masters project. You know, um, I've seen recreations done before and most of them are really bad and they do not pay homage, truly homage to the master who created, whose original idea was that image with that person. And so I feel like when you pay homage to somebody, you need to go through the same pain sake that they went through to create uh, a wonderful images. You know, they put time into thinking about what wardrobe they wanted Picasso to wear or Marilyn Monroe to wear. They, 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 they thought about it. They thought about the light. 
They thought about the camera angle. They thought about what kind of camera, what kind of film that they wanted to use. And for me just to um, go into any one of these Hamas shots and, uh, you know, spend very little time researching and kind of just nonchalantly put this together is not paying great, great, great homage to the master. You know, um, I wanted to, you know, I didn't want this to be a project that I did in post-production. You know, you know I'm, I'm from the old school and I learned how to do it right in the camera. And you do it right by doing the research Mm -hmm. And really, you know, it costs money to do a project like this the right way, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, take, for example, um, you know, well, even with the, the Pope's uh, clothing there, I mean, uh, of course, I couldn't get the Pope's robe and the Pope's cross that the Pope wore so often in his images um, at the Vatican. But if I do my research properly and I sit down with my stylist, my wardrobe stylist and my seamstress, we can actually take a look at that. We could blow that up so big on the screen, we could see that what kind of material that this was made out of. We could tell what kind of, uh, you know, the, um, the, 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 the cross, we could tell the detail on the cross and, and what kind of, uh, chain that really was and what kind of material the robe was made of and the shirt was made of we and then we can go and we could shop you know for this material and, and a lot of times we'll, we'll we'll shop vintage we'll shop from places that may have clothing we may take shirts that were made you know in the 1600s 1700s 1800s buy them then reconstruct them to our needs i mean that's how deep we go into with these homage images and uh, again if you don't do that then it becomes just another you know an, another uh, bad idea and i don't have time for bad ideas or to, to execute bad ideas mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well it's it's really really great to hear just how much kind of respect you have for those for those masters and then equally you know hearing about um the respect that you have for the transgender community as well because and, it, and it's apparent as well because you know that image that um we have the print in the box set of the um transgender woman i believe they're in johannesburg and there are the flowers um kind of behind her and she sat on this chair in this very regal kind of way yeah um, who, who is the person in the image? Well, okay, so that was done in, in Catalego, jo Johannesburg. And uh, I was there uh, in Joburg in 2019, January 2019. I was working on another project called Glory. And it was all about black hair and the beauty uh, in black hair and black skin. I had started the project in Chicago, then decided to go to Joburg. Uh, to go work on on my on my glory project, and when I usually when I travel, um, I like to kind of do as many projects as I can because it costs so money to leave the studio, close the studio down. Uh, you know, you have employees still back there, but I'm not producing work. So whenever I go to where I'm going, I try to fit in as much as I can to make it as valuable of time as possible. And so I decided to um, pull together a shoot of some transgenders in Africa, which is very, 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 very difficult because um, in, in Africa, uh, most of the transgenders are in, in hiding. Uh, it's, they're, 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 um, it's very dangerous mm -hmm. for them to go out into the world because it is very looked down upon and there is a lot of murder uh, of the transgenders in Africa. So we had to uh, put this shoot together very secretively and have them all come from a community in one bus that was guarded by, you know, other people uh, who accept the transgenders there. And they brought them to this uh, small, small little town. And, and we found a... Uh, 
a, 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 a bar, little music hall that was very open-minded, that was going to allow us to shoot these transgenders in their place. And um, again, they showed up and they were just so, so, so lovely. They were so excited to have their photographs taken. And uh, we actually built these sets inside of uh, this little bar music joint. Uh, I had uh, been shopping at this festival and I ran into a gentleman in Joburg that was very, very, very creative. He was making his own clothes. Mm -hmm. And I asked him if he'd like to style for me, not the clothing, but together for us to make these backgrounds. And so we worked together and came up with just these fabulous, you know, they're all very much just materials that are, that are laying around on the streets in Africa. We brought them, we picked them up, brought them into this place and made these wonderful little sets and got this chance to shoot these beautiful, beautiful transgenders in Africa. Probably one of the most rewarding shoots in my whole career. Wow, yeah, it sounds it sounds beautiful, like a really beautiful experience. And one of like total human connection as well, which is something that I find looking through your work and even just included in these 10 images um, in this box set, there you, your kind of, um, your global, Kind of reach and how international your work is is really apparent so there's also the the photograph in morocco as well um and i know that you went there and took portraits of um is it the snake charmers and the um the kind of market sellers how do you kind of approach those people how do you how do you reach people and actually get them to feel comfortable enough with you to say yeah sure i'm happy to sit yeah, well, um, you know, that, that project in Morocco, um, you know, was kind of an inspiration of um, a project that Irving Penn did in the 50s and 60s, where he would, uh, you know, um, ask people in New York to pose for him. And, and most of them were tradespeople, uh, people who would have a trades, whether they were chimney sweeps, uh, chefs, uh, bakers, whatever they were. Um, I, you know, I'm, I, I remember, you know, uh, seeing this work of, of Irving's and, it, and, and, and when, I, when I see certain uh, bodies of work, they just stick in my mind. And uh, so I, you know, did some more research on the Irving Penn's work. And then I found out that, uh, of course, the wonderful August Saunders uh, did sort of the same thing in in Germany, and so I said I thought to myself, well, you know, wouldn't it be interesting for me to go to a country and find tradespeople and photograph them? And so I did this testing in my studio. You know, if you look closely at that shot, it's very very um, subtle. It's very subtle, but that's actually a black and white photograph on a color background. It's a very, very, very deep, deep, deep red. Where almost you don't almost you almost don't notice the background. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to find you know my own voice in this work. I didn't want it to be you know something that August Saunders did or or that Irving Penn had did. So I wanted to do a little bit of a mix of color and black and white, which is usually one of the biggest no nos in photography because it usually looks like hell. It usually, <laughs> it usually looks very cheesy and it looks very amateur-ish. Uh, so I experimented for a while in my, in my studio and I remember it took me almost two months to dye this background, this deep, deep, deep red that I wanted it to be. I kept on, you know, I have a bathtub in my studio and I kept soaking this huge piece of canvas in this red dye and we'd pull it out and we'd photograph it and it would be too bright. It was just too much. I just didn't like the way it looked. So we'd go back into the bathtub for another week, you know, and then we'd pull it out, stretch it, dry it, do another test. And finally I got it to the point where it was a very, very, very deep, deep burgundy red and that's what I wanted because I wanted it to be extremely subtle mm 
-hmm. in the background. So now getting back to your question, which I always go all over the place. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Um, You you know, uh, for me, uh, I've, I've never struggled with going up to people and asking, you know, I learned a lesson very, very early on. If you don't ask, you'll never get it. Uh, so, you know, again, I think I mentioned it earlier in our interview that uh, the way I feel is very important to treat people is with a tremendous amount of respect, love, and care. And I think when you approach anybody, uh, even a stranger, and they could tell that you're sincere and you are not uh, uh, intruding uh, but you are asking and you are, um, you know, with kindness in your heart and in your eyes, um, you are asking a favor of them. You're asking, some, you're, you're asking for a gift from them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've never found it to be a really real problem. I mean, do I get rejected? Of course. You know, uh, some people just don't want to be photographed. The Morocco in the beginning was very, very, very difficult. Um, Unfortunately, I mean, here's an interesting story. Magnum, uh, um, a group of Magnum photographers had just been down in Morocco the week before into Marrakesh, Mm -hmm. the week before we got there to do our project. And Magnum left the city uh, with a lot of people very, 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 very disappointed in them because... um, Magnum photographers, my feeling is, I mean, they, 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 they probably don't, they're not askers, you know, they're documentary photographers. So as soon as you ask somebody to take their photograph, you've lost the photograph. Mm-hmm. You've lost the mood. You've lost the, you know, what, you're, what you saw initially. So <clears throat> Magnum documentary photographers um, aren't the type of people that will ask for permission. And what happens there in a place like Morocco, where you're dealing with a lot of Muslim people, you know, they, they feel like you're stealing from them. You're, you're stealing a piece of their soul. So there was a, a, you know, all through Marrakesh, I mean, they had been there for a week shooting Marrakesh. It was a project, you know, for Magnum photographers to go shoot people in Marrakesh. And they left a lot of people very, 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 very mad and very disappointed. <laughs> And our first week in Marrakesh was an absolute disaster because we were trying to um, smooth out what had happened with these Magnum photographers. You know, we had to go, I remember we had to go in front of a consul uh, to speak to some government people about what our purpose was, what we were going to do with these photographs, uh, what we were going to give the people, um, and and see, it's something that Magnum photographers, they don't do. They, they don't reimburse or they don't take care of their subjects. It's really kind of a click, 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 shoot, 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 boom, I'm gone. You know, they don't even, sometimes they don't even speak to the people. So it leaves a, a very distasteful feeling, uh, in, in, in these people. So, um, after this week and we explained what we were there for and what we wanted to do, um, we also were compensating uh, every single person, uh, you know, bread is their number one food in America. They, they eat loaves of bread with every single meal. And we basically gave them enough money to buy three loaves of bread for a year. Yeah. So, I mean, in our terms of money, it's not a lot. It's like $50 each you know but they were able to i mean we would tell them you know this we want to buy you your bread for a year you know so we gave them this money and it was enough money to buy three loaves of bread for a year and and that right there was such a huge help Mm -hmm. for these people Mm -hmm. for any for anybody there you know because again it's excuse me it's somewhat of a, a a poor community and just the fact that we were uh, willing to, to, to give them, you know, something to help support them, uh, that helped us get just about anybody that we wanted because people were in need there. And then all of a sudden we found, you know, I would be able to go out and uh, 
look for the people who I wanted to photograph. And there'd be people coming up to us and saying, how about me? How about me? You know, will you photograph me? You know, and some of these people we would take on just, even though they weren't what I wanted, but we would do it to appease them because we couldn't, we didn't want to hurt their feelings. You know, so this happens a lot when you're doing a, a project like that there. But uh, we were there for, I think, three to four weeks. And I ended up doing, I think, over about 450 portraits uh, for this project, you know. And um, so it was very rewarding, but that's how we get it. I mean, I go up and actually just talk to the people. You know, and I also always hire somebody from the location that we're at. Somebody who knows the people, somebody who knows what kind of people are there, because I didn't know all the different crafts that uh, Moroccans do. And, you know, like I certainly would have, I, I certainly, I would have found the, the, the snake charmers, but, you know, I needed somebody to go bring me to the snake charmers. And then we, we have to always hire an interpreter too. And uh, in Morocco, they speak, uh, you know, a, a Berber, French, and there's another language that, that, that they speak there. And so we, I had to hire actually three interpreters, wow. you know, to, you know. So that's how a project, you know, like that's done. We're all, it's, it's a team. It's a team of people that it really takes. I could never go to a, you know, to a city like that by myself mm. and pull off what we pull off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like you're saying, you know, that, that kind of deep um, sense of humanity and respect that you have for, your, for the, these subjects is so apparent even in the composure of the sitter and you know how you adorn them um aesthetically as well it's just um it's really beautiful and it and it's great to hear that it was that it can sometimes be a kind of a collaboration with the people that are you know that you found um the final Photo photograph that I wanted to ask you about is kind of along those lines as well because I'm so intrigued by this character it's the um it's the man who it looks sort of like a warrior and he's head to toe painted in makeup as a skeleton and he's eyes he just has the most defiant look in his eyes that is just so captivating um wh where was that taken and and kind of uh who who, who is this figure in this yeah. character well, his name is Boy Mark, Boy Mark, and uh, he's from Papua New Guinea. And uh, I made three different trips over to Papua New Guinea to photograph the indigenous tribes uh, of Papua New Guinea. And this was, uh, uh, Boy Mark was part of the Malasali tribe. Um, so again, it's, you know, I've always been interested in, in, in cultures, um, I get a curiosity uh, about something and then I have to fulfill my curiosity by going there and actually uh, investigating and shooting, photo I don't wanna say shooting, photographing, um, you know, the people of uh, whatever I might be curious of. And with Papua New Guinea, I remember watching a film on, um, Oh, what was that gentleman? He was kidnapped. Um, oh, Rockefeller. Uh, Rockefeller, the young, young Rockefeller boy that was kidnapped. And so I watched this documentary on, on, uh, on him. And, you know, that documentary, uh, which was shot back in the 60s, and there was still a, a, a lot of um, headhunters and um, cannibalism going on in Papua New Guinea. Uh, for some reason, that rose some interest in me. So I started doing some reading, more reading about Papua New Guinea, and decided that this is, you know, a country that I need to go visit. Mm. And uh, so, you know, this is, uh, Boy Marek is just part of the, the, the Oma tribe. Oma Mas, I'm, I'm actually reading this here is why I'm looking down. Mm. The, the Oma Masalali tribe. And uh, so I would, you know, I would travel down uh, the Sepik River and I would stop our canoe and we would approach these villages and we would set up our studio uh, wherever we would go uh, because these are all under controlled light. 
here. You know, um, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not the photographer that takes my, takes a 35 millimeter camera out with a 250, 300 millimeter lens and hides behind a bush and photographs people. That's not my style. My style is to be very intimate with my subject. And that means going meeting my subject and touching my subject, shaking hands, hugging, uh, having somebody communicate something for me, what I'm, what I'm doing there. Um, and that's what we did in Papua New Guinea. We did three trips there, and it looks like I'm gonna be making another trip there uh, this summer uh, to work on some films with a filmmaker who would like me to join him uh, this summer. So, you know, it's been a great project and uh, we're trying right now to get that book published. And, um, you know, it's just fulfilling to me to be able to share uh, with the world uh, images that uh, I would say probably in 20, 30 years, you're not going to see people like this here because uh, the world has become westernized and it has crept into uh, even these very remote places in the world where they have no phone, they have no, no, no computers, they don't have magazines, but somehow, you know, you will see, you know, the, usually by the missionaries, missionaries will bring in clothing, uh, Americanized or Europeanized clothing, you know, from Nike, Adidas, Champion, you know, uh, uh, you know, you, you'll find the, the losers of the Super Bowl uh, shirts will, will, will go to these, these places and, 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 they're, and they're wearing shirts of, uh, of a losing team. You know, mm -hmm. it's just the oddest thing in the world. And you're going to see in 20 years that, that they will no longer be wearing their traditional, you know, clothing. And uh, thus, what we do as photographers is very important for history because this is going to be probably the greatest reference. I don't know of anybody else who has spent as much time uh, who, or has done as many portraits in Papua New Guinea uh, as I have done here. And so I think it'll be a nice record, nice documentation for history for years to come. Absolutely. I love that image. I think that, as I said, the defiant look in his eyes, um, the, just the makeup, the attention to sort of detail, it's just absolutely beautiful. Um, yeah. And so these are just four images that we've discussed out of the 10 that are included in the um, selection. Um, how did you select those 10 in particular? How did you piece them together? Yeah, well, you know, for me, um, even though um, I believe in, 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 in series, I, I, I mean, almost all my projects are series. I, I, I don't do many one-offs uh, in a project, or if I have an idea, it's deeper than just a single image. It's usually a, a series and takes years and years to shoot. Um, so I decided that instead of doing just one complete series, it might be nice to share um, through this wonderful gift that you are doing to help hepatitis C, which is, I think is just, for me, is just absolutely beautiful that you're doing this. Um, I thought that um, it would be nice for the person who purchased my box to get just maybe just a little, little taste, a little taste of who I am. Uh, mm -hmm. These are just uh, uh, every single one of these images here uh, are, are part uh, of a much bigger uh, selection of work. Yeah, I mean, there's not an image here that was just a one-off. So this is all um, part of who I am. And, uh, you know, and each project uh, or each uh, <clears throat> series was a, you, you could actually document it as a different part of time of my life. You know, uh, and, and, and through this work, you could probably figure out some of the things that I was going through in my life or whatever. But that's, it's kind of like my diary. And so I just thought it'd be nicer to share um, from my heart some of the series that I felt were something that really helped me through my life, through my career, and share that with others. 
Mm. Thank you so much, Sandro. That's so beautiful. Um, and like you said, the collection altogether, it really is just some of the most stunning um, kind of taste, as, as, you, as you put it, of your work. Um, so we thank you so much. And it's truly an honour to include you in this charity project um, of the photography box sets. I would love to stay and ask you about every single one of them and more, um, but I will let you get on with your day. And <laughs> thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. And thank you for what you guys are doing. I do think it's really, you know, wonderful, wonderful work. And it, it is a response, our, our responsibilities as photographers to try to help as many as these uh, foundations and charities and people that are in, in need as, mm -hmm. as possibly can. It's, you know, you sell an image, somebody purchases an image, you know, two people are, are actually benefiting the person who purchased the box set and the recipient of the money that it comes to. So it's really a win-win situation with these, um, you know, programs. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much, Sandro. Um, well. Best of luck with all the projects and the feature film and all the rest of it. I'm really excited to see, see where that goes. Cool. <laughs> Bye.